G'day everyone. Day 12, more any 2 bulb flashing. All right, let's start with an easy one. I thought we'd continue on with this uh, theme because as I mentioned in the comments, I kind of wanted to do some random flashing and I had some other ideas. So let's do the ratio flasher. It's kind of this ratio metric version of the alternating flasher as we saw previously. We just had a single capacitor across the two bulbs and we had, you know, blink, 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 blink. One um, igniting would cut the other one off by you know pulling it through the capacitor. In this case we had an additional capacitor across one of the bulbs and that if you think about you know topologically kind of what the bulb sees, this bulb sees this capacitor in series with this capacitor to discharge into it and this bulb primarily just sees this capacitor. It doesn't I mean this capacitor is obviously there as well but there's this high impedance and, and very high impedance here when this guy isn't ignited. So really the time constant here is naturally higher than the time constant here would be, and you've also got this, um, you know, shunting effect that when this guy fires, it pulls charge out of this capacitor as well. So, with these values, you can change them and get different you know, ratios. But basically, you get three blinks here to one blink here, and I'll go well, like blink, 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 blink. <laughs> it's a little hard to see. On uh, I built it on the end of last, of yesterday's project and. Unfortunately, what's happening is my camera is aliasing this because of the frame rate because it's a little brighter in here. I don't know if I can make it stop down, but you'll have to take my word for it. This guy's flashing three times to this guy's single flash. It just sometimes misses the individual flashes because they're fairly brief. Uh, yeah, it's it, when it first starts up, you know, the first couple of flashes are a bit of a mess, but then once the voltages stabilize, that, that's actually true for pretty much all of these circuits, but... Uh, once they stabilize around the, um, you know, the hold voltages of these lamps, then it will lock into this pattern of uh, the ratio of flashes. What use is this? I mean, it's not, maybe it's just different for, for you know, blink and lighten purposes. But what you could might, might do with them is like, ultimately, they're not going to fire together and they fire in this ratio. So you might drive different things with the outputs from each and they have this harmonic relationship with, with each other. You can add additional ones as well and, and get interesting, somewhat even chaotic effects. You could try looping them. But uh, probably the most use is the circuit that I haven't really talked about. I've talked about the LED version of it, but you can have ring counting um, circuits where you have like a one hot, one lamp on kind of representation and you, you turn them off and the, it, the Voltage, you know, jumps across the capacitor to the next one. There's various ways to, to build those. The, the most common, well, some of them involve diodes, some of them just involve alternating um, capacitor, you know, like turn resistor upside down. I should just draw them or build one for some other day. But you could potentially use these to clock one of those those loops um, for, you know, blink and lighten purposes or for digital logic purposes. They're, I, I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head why you might want to do this, but it, it's interesting. I digress. Just build it, play with it. It simulates fine. Um, it looks interesting on the oscilloscope. If, if you are going to probe it on the oscilloscope, just be aware that probing mains means, you know, everything here is hot. And if you connect ground to here, bad shit will happen. So you either want to float the power supply completely or maybe power it like I was using, you know, some kind of DC high voltage generator. Maybe that will be another day, just making a, a little neon um, power supply for you know, a couple hundred volts at a few milliamps, because that's super straightforward and incredibly useful. Yeah, anyway, I digress. Uh, this is the power supply that we used last time. The other device that, that I'm going to show you in a minute, the random flasher, as promised, um, uses exactly the same power supply, right? Diode, cap, bleeder, resistor, series resistor to limit inrush current. Pretty straightforward. Okay, random flasher. The random flasher is not terribly different to the sequential flasher. It, um, the only difference is instead of connecting a capacitor between each stage and looping it, we connect all the capacitors to this common bus. Uh, I guess you could call it the blinking bus. I don't know. But the you don't need to define the voltage on this bus, but I added a 4 meg 7 resistor here, mainly to give the capacitors all an actual DC discharge path you know, through the power supply so that they wouldn't zap me. Um, but it's also kind of hard to explain how the thing starts up if you don't think of this as having a, a truly defined voltage because all the capacitors are kind of in series, right? And then uh, it doesn't really affect the chaos of the circuit 
adding this resistor or not having it, it's cheap insurance. I would recommend you add it. it anyway, enough. Let's look at the damn circuit, all right? All right, so here's the circuit. I built it pretty much the same way as previously. As you can see, I've actually added some enclosures so I don't kill myself. Um, we have the two copper rails. This is the high side. This is the low side. The low side is obviously the side which the electrode is going to glow on because the negative glow is what you're actually, you know, the cathode glow is what you see in a neon bulb. Um, there's all the resistors, these are the capacitors, and there's just kind of this common rail that goes around, loops around here like a U, and has the, the defining resistor there. The effect, I think, is interesting. It's this interesting mix of, like, there looks like there's some sequential moding going on, and then it will randomly jump to different modes. You can perturb it. I mean, it perturbs with mechanical, with RF. Like, have one of those neon sign testers. You can come and, like, you know, torture it with one of those, and it'll, it'll change how it behaves. It gets more frenetic in the dark, because I suspect the main reason is that the breakdown voltages all go up, and it generally becomes more sensitive to, uh, you know, perturbations of whatever kind. But neon bulbs obviously sensitive to pretty much everything, RF, mechanical. Um, you know, they all have different breakdown voltages. All the capacitors have their own tolerances. So there's a lot going on to truly understand how this circuit works. I'm not sure that any you know, model is really adequate because when these flash, they produce not only electromagnetic um, emissions, the like the, the actual light obviously can interact with the the adjacent ones with the photoelectric effect, and there's a you know coupled radiation. There's a lot going on. Um, the end result is fascinating. It looks cool in the dark, and you should build one. Wouldn't make a terrible Christmas tree topper. Like you could imagine a star. Maybe you have all being the one or you have one you know set or you have an individual one maybe for each arm of the star because only one lamp will be on it at once most of the time anyway uh they, they start up and settle down pretty quickly obviously you want to insulate it pretty well but it don't run straight off mains but it's the kind of thing you could imagine you plug into the end of your christmas lights it pulls virtually no power and uh well maybe it's a little too frenetic though and it might be a bit of an attention grabber but it's an interesting circuit. Um, mechanically here, this is just a 50 millimeter piece of acrylic tube. And I printed some caps. They're 1.5 millimeter wall thickness. Uh, you know, I just used OpenSCAD to design them. I have a little uh, rounded slot there. If I had thought about it more before I hit print, I would have probably made some kind of cable clamp in the bottom, but I just hot melt glued that, which looks like crap, but works fine. And maybe you want some kind of spreader to ensure that the circuit stays centered you kind of like those micro spaces that you see inside vacuum tubes that's some kind of keying feature on the thing you're trying to suspend and it's you know just a little bit smaller than the internal diameter of the tube uh, you also might want to put a hook on this end to hang the thing up or just dangle it by its cord i suppose but i obviously put the yesterday's project in the same tube to also not kill myself um one additional random flashing circuit is this one, which I found in a book. It's uh, it's interesting, topologically, like you've got these crossovers, right, and it's kind of a, a loop, sort of, but not. Uh, I built it originally with, with all the, the capacitors and resistor values being the same, and it does work. It's not perhaps as interesting if you don't have different time constants, so I put 4, 470 nano here, 220 nano here, and 100 nano for those two. These are 10 meg. It requires a high voltage, obviously, because you have two neon bulbs in series, at least to start up. Once it stabilizes, there's capacitor voltages, you know, have charged up, uh, and things are a little bit, well, more complicated, <laughs> shall we say. Really understanding how this works, I'm not sure I completely do understand how this works. It's also a little underwhelming. I mean, we can, we can look at the physical circuit here. Um, Although, to be fair, I may have damaged this circuit a little bit because I cranked the voltage up and down a few times and may have damaged one of the capacitors, but it's pretty much doing what it did when I first powered it on. It looks sometimes like it's stuck in a mode, but then it will get out of it, it will jump out of it. It's, again, very sensitive to light and the amount of time that it's been on, so there's probably temperature stuff going on. Uh, it's sensitive to voltage, like all of these things, they run faster at high voltages because they get to the breakdown voltage faster, right? Like basic stuff like that, sensitive to RF, etc. Um, 
yeah, I think it's it's topologically and electrically interesting, but maybe not as exciting because you generally do have two bulbs on at once, and you get sometimes fairly long runs of of what would be you know cyclostationary behavior, but then it will hop out of that into more chaotic stuff. So fascinating. Not sure I completely can explain exactly how it works, but build it, play with it, it's interesting. If you're in the US and you actually want to run off the mains, you'll need a voltage doubler of some description. It will run off about 210, 250 volts, it'll be a little bit dim, but it will start around that. This will be fine, right? Like two capacitors, two diodes, inrush limiter, discharge resistor. Word of warning though, there's no DC discharge path for the capacitors once charged, so if you power it off, there will be significant voltages on these. I dealt with this situation by simply flossing the circuit with a piece of solder to discharge the capacitors, you know, just shorting them out. That worked fine, and I was also just pretty careful with it, like right now it's charged and if I picked it up, I'd, oh, I mean the rails are fine. But those interstitial capacitors are floated right with the high impedances of the bulbs, so they can they can give you an unpleasant shock. It's not going to kill you. Right. The worst, the biggest one there is 470 nanometers charged to a couple hundred volts. It's not going to hurt that bad. Definitely not going to kill you, but it's you're going to probably swear. So to avoid that, just be careful. It's difficult to add discharge resistors here because of these fairly high potentials, high resistors already. I mean, if if you like scaled everything then maybe you know 10 megs or, or would be acceptable. You could either put them across the capacitors or across the LEDs, uh, across the neon bulbs themselves. I don't know if you'd actually want to do that or just be careful with it or maybe just not build it because it's actually not as cool as this, even if it does require a few more capacitors to build this. This is definitely more scalable and more understandable. <laughs> uh, from what I can tell, it can scale up almost indefinitely but it does have that limitation that there's really only one bulb on at a time. Um, yeah, make of that what you will. It might just matter in the application that you're using for the blinking lights. Okay, that's uh, that's kind of it for today. Um, apologies for not getting this video out earlier. There's been very significant wind and rainstorms here and the electrical infrastructure and data network around here got pretty much destroyed. I had power outages for several days on and off and I had no internet until only about an hour ago when they finally physically reconnected the cables that had been taken out by trees so I'm I'm fine there are many people in this uh, more lower lying areas than I am in who got flooded by the river local river breaking its bank so um you know, obviously I feel a lot worse for them than me just complaining oh I didn't get my video done on time so anyway I will endeavor to try and catch up this is obviously day 12 we're halfway try and do something completely different tomorrow and uh, I think that's everything I wanted to say about neon blinky things for now alrighty see you tomorrow <laughs>